The Lord of the Rings trilogy began 20 years ago and they remain some of the best films ever made. With the new Amazon series coming out this year, I think it's a better time than ever to look back and see what made these films so special. Ever since this trilogy came out when I was a kid, it had quite the impression on me. I ended up learning practically everything there is to know about Middle-earth and basically became an expert on Lord of the Rings lore. So rest assured that you're in good hands with me. The first film of the trilogy, The Fellowship of the Ring, came out in 2001 and was a commercial and critical success. The next two installments, The Two Towers and Return of the King, were just as successful. In fact, Return of the King was one of the first films ever to gross over a billion dollars at the box office. It won 11 Oscars at a time when Oscars were still somewhat related to film quality and not just a competition of how much degeneracy could be crammed into a single film. It's a clean sweep. The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, Barry M. Osborne, Peter Jackson, and Fran Walls producers. All three Lord of the Rings films remain fondly remembered by millions to this day. Everyone at the time could tell there was something special about these films. They weren't simply another Hollywood cash grab or propaganda designed to demoralize the population. No, these were different. Today, Lord of the Rings has not only stood the test of time, but has exceeded it. The Hobbit films were created a decade later and were far worse films in almost every conceivable measure. He, he's infected! <gasps> you won't. Meanwhile, the new Amazon Rings of Power series looks like a disaster before it's even released. It's now dawning on all of us that we may never actually see something like Lord of the Rings again in our lifetimes. Which begs the question, why? What made it so unique, especially compared to the film industry of today? Hi, I'm Pax, and in this video we'll be looking at what makes Lord of the Rings so special. While a lot of videos have tried to tackle this issue, I'll be examining it from angles that many overlook. From production value, to character writing, to the story's moral values, Let's talk about the brilliance of Lord of the Rings. To understand Lord of the Rings, you must first understand its creator, John Tolkien. We'd never be able to appreciate the brilliance of the story without understanding him and his books. Tolkien was an ingenious Catholic writer and World War I veteran from Britain. He first wrote The Hobbit in 1937 and expanded it into Lord of the Rings in the 1950s. Tolkien created the entire world and history of Middle-earth, the world that the Lord of the Rings takes place in, from the ground up. He invented entire languages specifically for his stories. If that's not passion and dedication, I don't know what is. Tolkien's works took a great deal of inspiration from ancient European folklore, which is what elves, dwarves, trolls, and many other creatures of Middle-earth are inspired by. Tolkien took these creatures of ancient folklore and put his own personal spin on all of them, making them truly unique. He also mixed them with creatures of his own invention, like orcs and hobbits. Yes, every time you've seen an orc, you can thank Tolkien. Tolkien's war experience and Catholic faith were critical to all of his writing, especially in Lord of the Rings. We'll talk more about that later. It can't be understated that Tolkien's influence essentially created the mold for what we understand as modern fantasy. Every other fantasy story since Lord of the Rings has imitated it or taken inspiration from it in some way. Harry Potter, A Song of Ice and Fire, even Japanese fantasy anime use many of Tolkien's ideas. And who could blame them? Tolkien's fantastic. This was one of the key strengths of the Lord of the Rings films, a serious respect for the source material they were based on. Director Peter Jackson truly wanted to bring Middle-earth to life in a way that honored Tolkien's work. In an interview, he said that they analyzed what was important to Tolkien and were trying to make the films for him, not for themselves. While the films were being created, Jackson and his team consulted Tolkien's letters and academic work to help them judge how to best adapt Lord of the Rings into a major motion picture. They also fought hard to ensure the story would be divided into several films. They wanted to show more of the story and minimize the number of events that had to be cut from the book. Miramax Studio, the original studio for the project, disagreed. They wanted everything to be condensed into a single film and pressured Jackson and his team to do it. However, they refused. In retrospect, who even knows how you could tell the story of Lord of the Rings in a single movie? This line of disagreement over creating one film or several actually led to an entire change in studio. Miramax dropped the project and New Line Cinema picked it up. Ironically, the Hobbit films would later have the opposite problem with film length. 
To put everything into perspective, each Lord of the Rings novel had over 100,000 words. This gave plenty of material to spread into three films. With The Hobbit, New Line Cinema tried to divide one book that was just 95,000 words into three films. The Lord of the Rings also ended up having several years of pre-production before filming even started, allowing the team to focus on details and prepare for everything very well. Compare this again to The Hobbit, where even Peter Jackson admitted that everything was being done on the fly due to time constraints. Every morning of the shoot, we're delivering the objects needed that day. There was none of this taking wonderful photographs in front of racks of armor completed a year before production as we did on Lord of the Rings. Because the Lord of the Rings films had all this time to prepare, they were treated as much of an artistic project as a money-making venture. In the early 2000s, it was strongly believed in Hollywood that more artistic effort meant higher commercial and critical success. For Lord of the Rings, the production team ended up creating over 40,000 pieces of armor, 19,000 costumes, unique sets for each part of Middle-earth, and unique designs for all the creatures of Tolkien's world. The books gave them plenty of visualizations to draw upon, but they also had to use their own imaginations for a lot of the designs. Many things in the story had never been fully pictured before, meaning Jackson and the designers had to rely on their own creativity. Take The Watcher in the Water, for example. Tolkien never actually fully described what it looked like. The way we visualize it today is largely because of these movies. The films highly benefited from coming out during a time when Hollywood was putting out massive historical epics. To get an idea of this, just look at some of the other films of the time period. Gladiator, Braveheart, Saving Private Ryan, The Last Samurai, even Pirates of the Caribbean. To put it simply, it was a fantastic time for this type of film. Unfortunately for all of us, since The Lord of the Rings came out, artistic effort became much less valued in Hollywood. Franchises like Transformers and Alvin and the Chipmunks destroyed the perception among studios that higher film quality meant more revenue. These were lazy films that relied little on art or writing, yet were still extremely commercially successful. To make matters even worse in the last decade, the Marvel franchise created a film environment where everything is expected to be a spin-off of something else, with little room for originality. We could blame the audience for this, we could blame the studios for it, but the fact remains true either way. The films also came at a time when CGI special effects had reached a critical level of advancement. They were good enough to be used frequently, but still weren't at the level where they could be used for an entire film. So rather than relying entirely on CGI, Lord of the Rings made use of practical effects that, frankly, look better than most CGI today. The trilogy ended up striking a beautiful balance between computer-generated and practical effects. Compare this orc from Lord of the Rings to this one from The Hobbit. Which one looks more realistic to you? To me, the difference is clear. By the late 2000s, most films began using CGI for basically all of their special effects. The Lord of the Rings had to go the extra mile, and it really paid off. And before we move on, no evaluation of the production of these films would be complete without appreciating Howard Shore's amazing soundtrack. It pulls you deeply into films that are already extremely well made. Who could ever forget the score during the ride of the Rohirrim scene or Gandalf fighting the Balrog? There's a reason these scenes continue to rack up millions of views on YouTube to this day. They're just some examples of how the soundtrack takes good scenes and makes them superb. But I could go on and on about the artistic and production quality of Lord of the Rings all day. While exceptional, this alone does not explain their significance as films. There are important layers to Lord of the Rings that many people may recognize intrinsically, but simply take for granted. Let's start with the first big one, and that is the fact that Lord of the Rings takes great inspiration from real-world European peoples and history. While Tolkien stated he wasn't a fan of direct allegory, he still used inspiration from many real-life things in his work. He would often take aspects from one real-life culture and combine them with aspects of another, and then he'd throw in his own fantasy elements to boot. Let's get into some specifics. The Shire is based on Tolkien's view of idyllic rural England. The people there live quiet peaceful lives and take joy in the simple things in life. Working farms, spending time with family, going to the tavern. This is how rural Europeans live through most of history. The films give the Shire a great wholesome feel, which is what I'm sure Tolkien intended. Then we have the Kingdom of Rohan, one of the story's major kingdoms of men. It basically takes a bunch of ancient European peoples and shake and bakes them into one culture. 
We mainly see inspiration from the Anglo-Saxons, the Goths, and the Nomads of the Eurasian Steppe. The Anglo-Saxon influence appears in Rohan's language, names, and culture. Theoden, Eowyn, Rittermark. These are all names from Old English. Meanwhile, the Gothic and Eurasian steppe influence comes from how Rohan is a cavalry-based culture, and they were also nomads who settled on the land they currently occupy. Then we have Gondor, the other major kingdom of men in Lord of the Rings. It follows a similar route. It takes a great deal of inspiration from Byzantium, also known as the Eastern Roman Empire. Tolkien even confirmed this in one of his letters. Like Byzantium, Gondor is a declining kingdom beset on all sides by threats. It's a splinter of a past, far more powerful civilization called Numenor. It's also the eastern half of a dual kingdom, where the western half has already fallen. You know, that kind of reminds me of something I've seen before. Gondor is also rivaled to the south by Harad, a land very similar to the real-life Arab or Islamic world. We see a bit of this in the films with Harad's costume design. And if you know anything about history, you know the clashes between the Byzantine Empire and the Islamic world. Now again, it should be emphasized here that Rohan and Gondor aren't meant to be direct allegories of any historical civilizations. But the inspiration and commonality between them and the real world is certainly there. What this ultimately does show us though is that Tolkien's story is Eurocentric. And I don't say that as a bad thing. This is probably why it resonated with people of European ancestry so much. So, do the Lord of the Rings films ignore this connection to Europe? Do they brush over it? Absolutely not. They follow Tolkien's lead by giving the Rohan and Gondor armies very European looks down to the actors who play them. You don't see any African or Asian men within the ranks. And to be clear, that isn't anything against Africans or Asians. They're simply not what these kingdoms are inspired by. New Line Cinema had absolutely no reservations about allowing their cast to be white. The idea that a film could be too white wasn't even a thought in anyone's head making these films. And the audience 20 years ago respected this. Hardly anyone took issue with actors of European descent being cast in a Europe-like world. This all needs to be brought up because we're going to see a radically different direction taken in the new Amazon series coming out later this year. From the look of things, they're going to simply ignore the European inspiration of Tolkien's world. They are, for lack of a better word, blackwashing it. Look guys, if you wanted to make a show with Dark Elves, you should be making an Elder Scrolls series. Not Middle-earth. How did it come to this? This is all part of a broader change in ideology in Western media that's occurred since the Lord of the Rings films. It essentially demands that anything involving white people needs to be diversified. Now many might ask, is the ideology driving this trend anti-white specifically? Well, let's look at it this way. No one takes issue when African actors portray African characters or Chinese actors portray Chinese characters. There was no problem when Wakanda and Black Panther was shown as an all-black society. And there's nothing wrong with portraying it that way. Just as there should be nothing wrong with portraying a European environment with European actors. Many people today call this phenomenon wokeness. But I think there's a better way to explain it. This phenomenon is a result of white people losing confidence in their own history and culture. When white people start standing up for themselves again, this all stops. But I think you understand that point. Now let's get back to Lord of the Rings. Another aspect that makes Lord of the Rings so special is Tolkien's Catholic beliefs and how they directed the story. Tolkien stated that the religious element of Lord of the Rings is absorbed into the story and the symbolism. He also said that it's a fundamentally Catholic work. And throughout the films, we see what he means by this. Let's start by examining the ring itself. During the story, we see that the ring has a corrupting effect on everyone it comes into contact with. Even the most noble and strong-willed people, like Ladriel and Gandalf, fear its corrupting influence. Exposure to the ring can cause anyone to be corrupted or driven mad. This is due to the fact it's infused with Sauron's evil power and that power comes with a very tempting pull. With enough time, the ring can make even the most innocent people become monsters who destroy themselves and the people around them. With that all said, let's talk about one of the ring's biggest victims, Gollum. Who is Gollum? He was once a hobbit named Smeagol who lived a normal life. Like other hobbits, he spent his time being peaceful and enjoying hobbies like fishing. Until one day, the unthinkable happened. 
Smeagol came into contact with the Ring. He was corrupted by it almost immediately and killed his own cousin and best friend Deagle to take the Ring. But rather than the Ring bringing joy to his life, it brings him only horror. He flees the other hobbits to live in solitude and slowly loses his humanity. As time went on, more and more of his old self faded away, and from Smeagol, he became Gollum, a creature twisted in both mind and body. All he lived for anymore was the ring, his precious. We even forgot our own name. And though the ring granted him an unnaturally long life, in the end it still abandons him for Bilbo. When we meet Gollum in Lord of the Rings, he's on a quest to get the ring back as he sees it as his own. He spends the films plotting how to kill Frodo to finally reclaim it. But due to being separated from the ring, and due to Frodo's kindness, parts of the old Smeagol start to shine through. We're introduced to the good side of Gollum, and he goes through a moral crisis of whether he should let the ring go or continue pursuing it. Although in the end Gollum cannot let go of the ring, he did come close, and that is a commendable feat. I have to say that he's up there with some of the best characters of all time. His struggle with the ring, and his own conscience, are unforgettable. What we see in the struggle of Gollum, and other characters with the ring, is that the temptation of the ring is easily equatable with the temptation of sin. People who indulge themselves with it may receive a temporary boost in power, but ultimately have their souls corrupted. Frodo spends the entire story desperately trying to resist the temptation of the ring. It drives him to the point of insanity. Even a character as kind-hearted as Bilbo had to be forced by Gandalf to let go of the ring, and he turns demonic when he gets the chance to grab it later on. Boromir, who's a noble leader of men, is willing to murder Frodo to try to use the ring's power. He thinks that by doing it he can save his people, but he is sorely mistaken. Taking the ring would only corrupt him and make him as evil as Sauron. In the end, only by continuously resisting the temptation of the ring is the Fellowship finally able to defeat Sauron. But even then, they ultimately fall short. In the final sequence in Mount Doom, Frodo fails. Like mankind, despite his best efforts, he still could not overcome the temptation of sin. He refuses to throw the ring into the volcano willingly and tries to take it for himself. It's only Gollum's intervention and fall off the cliff into the lava that causes the ring to finally be destroyed. We should note that in the books, Frodo does not struggle with Gollum. Instead, Gollum is celebrating with the ring and accidentally falls in on his own. One popular interpretation of these events is that Eru Iluvatar, the god figure of Lord of the Rings, directly intervened and pushed Gollum in. I like this interpretation because it shows how all of mankind could not defeat the ring. It was only the intervention of God that brought things home in the end. This of course harkens to Christ's sacrifice on the cross, defeating sin for mankind. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And speaking of Jesus, multiple characters take on Christ-like roles in the story. Let's start with the ring bearer himself, Frodo. Frodo carries the ring like Jesus carried the cross. Despite the pain, suffering, and threat of death he experiences, he never gives up or loses hope. It's his innocence and pureness of heart that allows him to resist the ring for as long as he does. And people often overlook that he didn't have to make the trip to Mount Doom, he volunteered himself for others. But he isn't alone though. Sam is there as a Simon or Mary type figure who's there to help Frodo in his biggest times of need. Sam proves himself to be the true definition of a friend, standing by Frodo no matter the cost. Tolkien also wrote that Sam is a reflection of the English soldiers and self-sacrificing people he knew during World War I. Frodo and Sam both consistently show Christ-like attributes through the story. There's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. Then, of course, there's Gandalf. Like Jesus, he's a teacher and mentor to everyone he encounters. He guides the characters through their darkest moments and helps them to carry on, such as when Frodo almost gives in to despair in Moria. 
It's safe to say that without his teachings and leadership, the Fellowship never would have succeeded and Middle-earth would have fallen. In the Lord of the Rings lore, the wizards of Middle-earth were sent by God to guide mankind. Gandalf is the only wizard who truly stayed loyal to this mission. In contrast, Saruman became a Judas who betrayed his mission in pursuit of his own personal gain. And just like Judas, in the end, Saruman pays for his sins. During Fellowship of the Ring, Gandalf literally dies to save the Fellowship in one of the most iconic scenes in the film. Like Christ, he is later resurrected and comes back to complete his mission once and for all. I've been sent back until my task is done. So, if Frodo reflects Christ's pure-hearted struggle, and Gandalf reflects his role as a teacher, Aragorn reflects Christ as king. He is the true heir to Gondor and in the end of the story is crowned king. He becomes Middle-earth's main leader against the forces of evil. He also shares Christ's power to command the dead, which we see him do in the third film. We watch Aragorn become a true leader who exemplifies all the traits a good king should have. Benevolence. Honor courage, and moral fortitude. Aragorn is even willingly offered the ring by Frodo in the first film, but he rejects it, one of the only characters ever to do so. This is especially significant since Aragorn is descended from Isildur, the man who had the original chance to destroy the ring, but kept it for himself. Aragorn does what his ancestor could not and resists the ring. In other words, Aragorn is very special. Now that we've established the Christ-like elements in Lord of the Rings, it's worth exploring how the entire moral framework of the series is subtly Christian. Though it isn't shown in the films, Tolkien's lore has a god figure, Eru Iluvatar. He created the entire universe that Lord of the Rings takes place in. His creation was then corrupted by Melkor, who is essentially the Satan of Tolkien's universe. There are also angel-like entities called Valar and Maiar, of which Gandalf, Saruman, and Sauron all are a part of. The battle for Middle-earth could pretty much be viewed as a battle between fallen angels and angels who stayed loyal to God. And let's not forget, of course, that there's confirmed to be an afterlife in Lord of the Rings, which we see Gandalf explain to Pippin. End? No, the journey doesn't end here. Death is just another path, one that we all must take. But in terms of how the moral framework of Lord of the Rings is just like Christianity, let's stop and ask ourselves a question. What exactly is evil in Lord of the Rings? What makes Sauron a dark lord other than being dark and scary? The answer here is that evil in Lord of the Rings is that which goes against God. Sauron and Melkor are evil because they work against Eru Iluvatar, or God, and seek to corrupt his world. Remember that Sauron himself is essentially a fallen angel. He lost his position among the other angels because he sided with Melkor against God. But just like Satan in Christianity, Tolkien tells us that no matter how hard Melkor or Sauron tries, all of their evil will only amount to further showing the glory and goodness of God. That's a pretty incredible thought. But Sauron and his allies still try their hardest to spread evil. One major way we see this evil manifested is brutality and hatred towards nature. In The Two Towers, it's shown how Saruman's industrialization is tearing the forests of Middle-earth apart. This leads to a clash with the Ents, the supernatural protectors of the forests. They don't want to get involved with the affairs of men, but in the end their hand is forced. They march on Isengard and destroy it. When the Ents destroy Saruman's war machine, it reminds us all that nature is something ever-present and cannot be abused. Given the war on nature going on in current Western society, this is a lesson we all really need to be reminded of. Battles against nature do not end well. We can contrast Saruman's abuse of nature with the Elves who live in harmony with it. This dichotomy comes from Tolkien's own skepticism of technology and industrialization. He hated the negative effects these things had had on Britain's natural environment and how it pulled people from a rural life into an urban life. To him, the world of the country was a much more beautiful, fascinating place than the world of the city. But where our hearts truly lie is in peace and quiet and good till birth. 
So it's clear that respect for the natural world is a key motif in Lord of the Rings. Now it's time to look at the final major theme that's written into the story. This is that things in Middle-earth aren't as good as they used to be. It is largely a world in decline. The story takes place in the Third Age, after the First and Second Ages. Tolkien makes it a point to tell us how elves, dwarves, and mankind were much better off in past ages. Galadriel tells us exactly this at the start of the first film. Much that once was is lost, for none now live who remember it. By the time the Lord of the Rings takes place, the greatest elven and dwarven kingdoms have all fallen. The kingdoms of men that remain are crippled and weak. The movies often feature ruins of these past beautiful civilizations. This was the great watchtower of Amon Sur. In Fellowship of the Ring, for example, we see Weathertop and Moria. Weathertop is a ruin from the Kingdom of Arnor, which was destroyed by the Witch King of Angmar long before the events of Lord of the Rings. And then there's Moria. Let's take a second to talk about Moria. What was once the greatest dwarven kingdom in all of Middle-earth is now a cold, ruined dungeon. At the time of the first film, it had been abandoned for over 1,000 years. How did it get this way? Well, we're told in the films. The dwarves delved too greedily and too deep and awoke a Balrog. This ancient demon, awoken by the dwarves' greed, proceeded to wipe them out and drive them from their kingdom. There's definitely a not-so-subtle moral lesson there. As for the elves, their time in Middle-earth is ending and they're all abandoning it to go to the Undying Lands in the West. The theme here reflects Tolkien's own Christian and medievalist worldview. It's common for people today to believe that the world is in a constant march of progress and always getting better. This is basically the belief of modernism. It assumes that mankind is on an inevitable path of advancement. It believes that people today are smarter and morally superior to people of the past. Lord of the Rings rebukes this entirely. In Middle-earth, things in the past were actually better. By a lot! The men of the Third Age are inferior to their ancestors from the First and Second Age. In the Silmarillion, it's described how the First Age featured men who were far more powerful than any we see in Lord of the Rings. Baron and Turin Tarambar are heroic men of the First Age who make all other men, even Aragorn, look weak in comparison. The elves of the time were so powerful, they could kill Balrogs and dragons single-handedly. Even our main villain, Sauron, is far weaker than his master, Melkor. The point of all this is that Lord of the Rings presents us with a world that is not in a state of inevitable progress, but one where decay is real and felt. Things can get bad if men fail to live up to their ancestors. This comes from the Christian worldview that mankind is sinful and has experienced a fall from grace. Unlike, say, a liberal worldview, men are not guaranteed a good and noble world just because they exist. For Aragorn and the Fellowship, it takes heroic and life-changing struggle to make their world better. The story only has a happy ending and doesn't end with Sauron's total victory because of the heroic actions of our heroes. And the heroes of the story have very heartfelt reasons for why they fight as hard as they do. One of their biggest motivations is to protect their people and to carry on the legacy of their ancestors. All of the main characters have a deep connection to their family ties. Gimli constantly boasts about his dwarven relatives. Aragorn frequently invokes his ancestor Elendil as a battle cry in combat. Behold the sword of Elendil. Elendil was a great man of the Second Age who founded Gondor and Arnor. He also led the last alliance we see in the prologue that defeated Sauron. While over half of Americans can't name all four of their grandparents, Aragorn can trace his lineage back over 3,000 years. And while we're on this subject, let me bring up a character I haven't yet. King Theoden. One of his key character motivations is his desire to live up to the accomplishments of his ancestors. Through the films, he is distraught by the idea that he's not doing enough to live up to his title as king. He's ashamed that Grima and Saruman had gotten the better of him. It isn't until his role in saving Gondor that he finally feels satisfied. When he dies in battle at Minas Tirith, he does so in the comfort that his efforts have finally made him a king worthy of his ancestors. I go to my fathers, in whose mighty company I shall not know if you're ashamed. 
To put it all simply, there is no radical individualism found in Lord of the Rings. Characters in the story deeply care about their history and peoples. And so, here we are 20 years after this journey began. As you can tell, it's not just one or two things that make The Lord of the Rings brilliant. It's the culmination of many books of genius writing, years of preparation, and a film team with the desire to exceed all expectations. I watched the films again to make this video, and I was blown away by their quality once again. There's just so much we can learn from them from both a production and moral perspective. If you haven't seen them yet, I highly recommend giving them a watch. They set the standard not just for fantasy, but for all other epic films since. And surprisingly, hardly any other films since have matched up to them. Few movies have captured the magic and soul that the Lord of the Rings trilogy showed us so well. In many ways, it actually feels like American media has been going backwards since these films. Stories like Game of Thrones even tried to deconstruct Lord of the Rings, just to end up being vastly inferior nonsense. Perhaps we find ourselves in the same situation as Middle-earth, a world in decline. If the upcoming Amazon series does nothing else, hopefully it brings attention back to the original trilogy and books. And then we could at least say it did one good thing. In any case, let's thank God we were blessed with the brilliant piece of literature and film that is Lord of the Rings. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, leave a comment letting me know what you think. I've also officially started a Patreon. These long-form videos take a serious amount of time to produce, so if you'd like to see more, you can fund them there. I appreciate all the support, and I will see you in the next video.